thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started with some of the introductions here. I know we have a pretty packed program for you all, so I want to make sure that we get to everything we have planned for tonight. But thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I see that we have people all over from New York, Canada, Tokyo, and all other places. So we really appreciate you taking the time out of your morning or your evening to join us tonight um, as we are celebrating the launch of volume four of Monkey, New Writing from Japan. Um, if you're new to the Japan Society of Boston, please check out our website for more events like this celebrating Japanese culture. We, as the oldest Japan America Society um, in the US offer both online, in-person, free and paid events and other resources um, related to Japan, US-Japan relations. Um, so please check us out if you are interested. Um, for this program tonight, we ask that you, um, as I said, please change your Zoom name to whichever name you registered for this program with. Um, that would be very helpful to us. Um, we also ask that you please remain muted during the presentation to respect our speakers and other attendants. Um, you may choose to keep your camera on or off, whichever you're more comfortable with. And um, this program will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, you may add any questions to, that come to mind in the chat throughout the program, but we'll select a few um, questions to be answered by the speakers at the end, um, as well as a video of this program will be uploaded to YouTube and shared to all the registrants in the next days, um, couple of days. So if you have to leave early for whatever reason, um, you'll be able to watch the program in full on YouTube and that will be sent to your um, registration email. So to introduce our guests for tonight, we are joined today by one of the major contributing editors of Monkey, Roland Kelts, who is also our longtime author of the Letters from Tokyo series that um, we have on our website. He's the author of Japan America, How Japanese Pop Culture Has Invaded the U.S., and is also a lecturer, um, excuse me, <clears throat> has lectured at several universities in both the US and Japan. Roland has written for many distinguished publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Japan Times, and others, and is also a primary source on Japanese culture for CNN, BBC, CBC, NHK, and more. His latest book is The Art of Blade Runner, Black Lotus. Um, I am dropping all the relevant um, links in the chat below throughout the program for your reference. Uh, we are also joined by Motoyuki Shibata, who is the founding editor for Monkey. He is a translator of American literature and has translated the works of many acclaimed authors, including his translation of Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which was a bestseller in Japan in 2018. He is currently Professor Emeritus at the University of Tokyo. And then finally, um, last but certainly not least, we have Satoshi Kitamura, who is a picture book author and illustrator and major contributing at, um, illustrator for Monkey. He has worked as a freelance illustrator of advertising and magazines in Japan for many years, but it was while he was living in London that he illustrated his first picture book, Angry Arthur, which won the Mother Goose Award in 1983. Kitamura-san now resides in Kobe, Japan, and along with his work with Monkey, illustrates a weekly article in Asahi Shimbun newspaper, which he has been doing for the last 15 years. Um, so thank you to our three guest speakers for joining us tonight, and I will pass it over to Roland Kelts to continue our program. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Uh, this morning here in Tokyo and this evening uh, there in Boston. Um, wish we could uh, all be there, um, except it's too cold <laughs> for us to be there right now. Um, but we're delighted to be coming to you from uh, Tokyo on this lovely morning. Um, I am really grateful to the Japan Society of Boston for hosting this uh, launch event for Monkey New Writing from Japan. Uh, this is a launch event for volume four of Monkey, which is the music issue and is incredibly delightful, I can assure you, if you haven't picked up a copy already. Uh, they are in the links, I think, right now that Joanne is posting. 
um, you can grab a copy yourself. There's an ebook version. There's uh, uh, actually there's a print version as well, the old fashioned version. And uh, we're very thrilled to uh, to be part of this event uh, for the Japan Society of Boston. I want to thank, of course, Naoko Takayanagi uh, and uh, Joanne Ha, who've done extra work getting this uh, put together. Uh, and we're very, very happy to be here. The title of this event is How Japanese Stories Hook the World. And as many of you know, from uh, manga to no plays to anime, to short stories, to novels, uh, and tanka poetry across the board. Um, Japanese storytellers are really uh, at the top of the heap in the global literary conversation today. Uh, wasn't always the case. And um, my uh, two partners in crime here today, Motoyuki Shibata and Satoshi Kitamura, will uh, tell you more about that. But uh, this, uh, this publication started, uh, believe it or not, uh, 12 years ago, and uh, 13 years ago, if you count the uh, meetings that we had to get it off the ground, and was co-founded uh, by Professor Ted Goosen from York University, who is also a major literary translator uh, and has put together uh, years ago the Oxford uh, Book of Japanese uh, Short Stories, which is used as a textbook uh, around the world. Um, and Moto came up with the idea back in 2010, uh, along with uh, uh, Ted Goosen. Ted Goosen wanted to, was asked to create another anthology and instead decided it would be more fun to take a contemporary Japanese publication and introduce new and emerging writers to a global readership. That was really the foundation of this project, which started, as I said, as Monkey Business in 2011, and then more recently changed to Monkey, New Writing from Japan. And as Moto has said in the past, it's because he realized there is no business in literature. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's better to just have fun and play around. And that's really the genesis of this project. Um, before we get started here, I also want to thank our incredible managing editor, Meg Taylor, in the United States, uh, without whom, to be honest, we would not be here. Uh, Meg uh, does a yeoman's job uh, taking care of so many aspects of Monkey uh, on the U.S. side and has really, really galvanized uh, this project, um, and she's a critical part of it. So Meg Taylor, I mentioned Ted Goosen, Professor Ted Goosen. Um, we also have a team in the US that consists of uh, Tiff Joshua, TJ Ferentini, uh, Kaori Drome, Kaori Drome, and Sayaka Toyama, who help us deal with the North American side of Monkey. And they're all uh, critical uh, partners here. Uh, also want to mention something very, very important, which is that uh, Monkey started an imprint with our partners at Stonebridge Press in California. Stonebridge has been around for a while, as uh, some of you know, I'm sure, uh, publishing terrific books uh, focused on Asia and particularly on Japan. And our Monkey imprint is a fiction, uh, as you can imagine, it publishes fiction books uh, novels and short stories, and I'm delighted to announce that just a day or two ago we learned that the second book at the uh, Stonebridge Press Monkey imprint, which is just out, called Dragon Palace by the terrific Hiromi Kawakami, uh, Dragon Palace, the second book, uh, was just named to the New Yorker's 100 best books of 2023. So this year's 100 Best Books includes Dragon Palace by Hiromi Kawakami, and that is translated by Ted Goosen. If you haven't seen it, it's right here and is available through the uh, Stonebridge Press website and other booksellers. It's a lovely and magical book of short stories by Hiromi Kawakami. This is the issue that we're celebrating today. Uh, which is just out in North America and available, uh, Monkey Volume 4. 
And as you might guess from the cover, we do these themed issues, and this issue's theme is music. And the cover design is by Satoshi Kitamura, who is with us today. So this is available right now in North America. And just for your edification, the original monkey is in Japanese and comes out three times a year. And uh, this year, in fact, uh, the two issues uh, dropped in Japan in the same month. <laughs> so people have been working very hard to bring these, uh, these issues out. And this is volume 31 of the original Japanese monkey. I should mention that the two issues, the Japanese and the English, are not actually identical. They contain different contents and original contents. So if you do read Japanese, uh, it might be worth your time to pick up both and, uh, and compare them and enjoy them. Um, I can assure you the contents of both are absolutely uh, terrific. The first uh, publication in our uh, Monkey Imprint series, uh, The Thorn Puller by Hiromi Ito, uh, also won awards. And in fact, the next two books in the series are coming out this year. Uh, Takaoka's Travels uh, is coming out in the spring uh, of this, uh, yeah, sorry, of 2024, next year. We're almost there, uh, by Tatsuhiko Shibusawa. And that's translated by David Boyd. That has already won an award, the Sibley Memorial Award for Translation. And next fall, we'll uh, be publishing one of my favorite uh, contemporary writers, Tomoka Shibasaki, and her book, 100 Years and a Day, translated by Polly Barton from the UK. So those books are on the horizon. Uh, but today, we're focusing on monkey volume four. I've been privileged to be involved with this project since its uh, inception in 2010, 2011. And uh, over those years, we have been presenting Japanese writers to the world, uh, not only in publication, but also on stage. Uh, we've, uh, we've done events in New York and Chicago, in Boston, uh, and other parts of North America, including the West Coast, uh, San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and in parts of Asia. In fact, Satoshi and I uh, had a great time going down to Indonesia, uh, where we uh, were at the Makassar Writers' Festival, a wonderful event. And we also went to the Philippines uh, with the uh, Japan Foundation there. So um, this is kind of a big picture look at what this project is about. Um, I think uh, I'm delighted to uh, learn that some people are still discovering it, even though we've been around for 12 years, um, and discovering the new issues, which is, uh, which is very, very exciting. Um, we have published some writers who, frankly, uh, when we started, were, were unknowns and are now quite widely read in English, including uh, Mieko Kawakami, Hiromi Kawakami, as I mentioned, Hideo Furukawa, uh, Hiroko Oyamada, um, a number of authors who, when we started this publication, were not known at all in English and are now, uh, in some cases, uh, getting reviewed in major publications uh, in the US and around the world. So it's really exciting. And we've always had the support, uh, gratefully, of uh, probably the best known name in contemporary Japanese literature, Haruki Murakami, uh, who features in a number of issues. So what's exciting to me now is that we're going to talk a little bit today about the art, craft, and challenge of translation, uh, which is no easy thing as some of you may know, uh, translating from Japanese to English um, requires a certain intimacy and passion for both languages. Um, and I confess, I am not a translator. I just sit on the sidelines and admire what these wonderful translators do in bringing um, these artists and writers uh, into English uh, around the world. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to pass the microphone and the baton on to one of my dearest friends, 
uh, co-founder of Monkey and the Monkey Business Project, Motoyuki Shibata. Moto, you're on. Right, I, I've turned the microphone on. Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to uh, thank uh, everyone from uh, uh, Japan Society of Boston for uh, inviting us to do, to do this. Um, people often ask me why we call ourselves monkey or monkey business before that when we are a uh, literary magazine. I have a number of answers ready, and uh, one of the answers I use most often is that in Japan, literature is, or used to be uh, when we started, um, quite serious business. And we thought some non-serious element uh, would be nice to introduce into uh, the Japanese literary scene. So monkey business. And uh, as, as a Roland said, uh, uh, one thing we learned uh, running a literary journal is that there is no business in literary business. So we took it out and now uh, took, took, uh, took uh, business out and now we are simply a uh, monkey. And I hope this, uh, what might be called a sense of playfulness uh, goes well with, uh, with the what's going on in contemporary uh, Japanese literary scene. There is uh, so much sense of uh, uh, playfulness around in uh, uh, what uh, uh, contemporary Japanese writers do. Uh, for instance, uh, this is a book called uh, Obachan Tachi no Iru Tokoro by Aoko Matsuda, uh, where the wild ladies are in, in, uh, in Polly Barton's English translation. Um, this book, oh, uh, uh, incidentally, this book won a uh, World Fantasy Award a couple of years ago. Well, this is a this is basically a feminist rereading of Japanese ghost stories. So there's lots of anger and resentment in it. But Aoko uh, does it in such a, a playful manner with the, with the a big sense of fun, and this seems to be uh, typical of. Uh, uh, of the attitudes of so many uh, uh, contemporary Japanese writers today. And as far as the sense of fun in Monkey is concerned, I think uh, we learned a lot from uh, uh, literary mags in, in, in North America. Uh, for example, I always loved the covers of, uh, of uh, uh, this legendary uh, story magazine, all done by a uh, wonderful illustrator, R. O. Blackman. And uh, look at this. Uh, this is an issue from uh, uh, Max Sweeney's magazine from San Francisco. You, you open this and uh, you get uh, stories and poems in it. And uh, look at all the size, even the, at the bottom like this. <laughs> um, we cannot go so far as this, uh, but uh, we uh, we try to emulate uh, this uh, kind of a sense of fun, uh, which I often encounter in uh, uh, American uh, small literary uh, journals. All right, um, doing monkey, we are proud of three things. One, uh, we have. Uh, some of the best uh, stories and poems from uh, uh, contemporary uh, Japanese literary scene with uh, some modern classics such as uh, Inagaki Taruho or Ozaki, Osaki Midori uh, in, in, uh, in this particular issue. And always one or two uh, new uh, story or poem from uh, some uh, writers in North America. Uh, as Roland said, I translate contemporary American fiction, so so I know uh, some uh, writers if in the English-speaking countries, and they uh, are, are willing to join us in, in Monkey. And number two, we uh, work with uh, the best uh, literary translators from uh, Japanese to uh, English, starting with David Boyd, Polly Barton, and many others. And we like to think 
that uh, uh, we help these already good translators uh, become even better. Other editors um, uh, just look at the uh, English translations and edit them. And, and sometimes, of course, I mean, quite often they uh, they do a wonderful job, but uh, uh, almost no editor in English speaking countries, when they edit uh, Japanese literature, uh, almost no one uh, looks at the original uh, and compares the translation with it line by line. And that's what we do. Uh, let me show the uh, uh, example. So I uh, receive uh, the uh, first draft from the translator, and sometimes they uh, 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 give me some comments or questions, and I uh, go line by line, uh, take a look look at the original and the translation, compare them, and uh, I put in all these notes for the translator. Red is basically uh, a correction, and blue is a suggestion. And uh, uh, what's really gratifying is that uh, uh, good translators always uh, come up with uh, something better than what we uh, suggest. And, uh, and in that way, we like to think that we are helping them um, uh, become uh, even more uh, 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 professional as a, as a translator. You know, it's not just translation. You know, when when you are established and uh, more or less on your own, you know, no one uh, helps you to 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 uh, become better. No one teaches you how to uh, do it better. But um, uh, that's we like to think we are. Uh, that's what we are, we like to think we are doing. Hi, and uh, third. Um, we are very proud of, our, of the visual pages uh, of the of the magazine, um, and uh, 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 okay. If we time uh, later, I can show you some examples. But uh, uh, I first of all, I like to uh, point out that uh, for uh, for uh, for the visual element of the magazine, the the, the crucial guy is is Satoshi Kitamura. And uh, um, uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, him uh, with us today. So um, I think that's it for, for from me. And uh, I uh, uh, turn over the microphone to to Satoshi and Roland. Okay, thank you. Um, shall I uh, um, show the visuals? I think um, just a mm -hmm. second, please. Um, eto desu ne. Ah, yes, I have to speak in English, right? Mm. Yes. Um, this is the uh, sort of stories, short stories I I did for this monkey number four. Uh, because it's about music, I thought I should write something about music. Uh, so I, I called it Five Parallel Lines because of the lines in score. You know, music score has always have five parallel lines. Mm. And the first one is about the man on the piano, who's a musician who didn't play. He just mm. slept. And, uh, but mm, I, I won't read the, the whole thing. It takes too much time. And another one is about a musician, uh, maestro, who think, well, this is about a kind of, sort of the worry musician might have that they mm. are not probably as good as they they think they are and uh, uh this is called the sax which is about the mm. jazz music and taking a piano for a walk and this is about non-euclidean this is it's a sort of a joke that i come up with because of these five parallel lines and there's this thing called non-Euclidean geometry in uh, elliptical, uh, elliptic, elliptic square. Uh, the parallel lines meet. So I thought the Gauss is a mathematician, German mathematician, who came up with this non-Euclidean uh, geometry. 
uh, bumped into Beethoven uh, because they are contemporary and uh, and he kind of pulled Beethoven's leg by saying by all the parallel lines meets. So whatever you write on their music, the symphony, symphony music end up with just a single note. That's a kind of a joke. Anyway, and then this is a story I found recently, and it's called The Man on the Piano. It's the same as the, the story I wrote for this honky. And in fact, this one, I wrote in 1983, so exactly mm. 40 years ago. Mm. And in that time, I could hardly speak or write English properly, but I mean, anyway, I tried. So I, I, mm. I, I did it. Once there's a man on the piano who went basking, he put his hat on the pavement in front of his piano and started to play. He played, and there's a score of music with just lists on the score. And he sang, and he just snored. Mm. A passerby was very impressed and left all he had got in the man's hut. And uh, so the pianist played the next tune, a kind of pastoral, a pedestrian uh was delighted she paid compliments to the man the musician studied his favorite old number uh, but by the passage was so moved that she left token of her appreciation appreciation with his with him before she went and it made the artist avant-garde. Mm. A walkman was stunned by the performance and left his footprint beside the hut. And the next piece was Wharton's executed, um, the, uh, sorry, the man executed was the water music, which, uh, mm, ah, which made an excited crab submitted itself into the hut sideways. As the afternoon light went diminuendo, the man began to thrum a nocturne. Uh, from behind the curtain of clouds, a call of the invisible descended, craving after an anchor. So he did the last piece. The heaven was electrified and discharged and electromagnetic applause. Once there's a man on the piano. That's the end. I, okay. I remember I wrote this thing. First, I made a book. And so there are a certain number of pages and I just invented page by page and then I realized there's no more pages, so I just finished the story. So there's mm -hmm. no plot or anything except that it's about the man on the piano. And um, so, uh, can I start talking with Laurent? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm uh, thrilled. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Satoshi, one of the questions I've always wanted to ask you yeah. about, um, you've lived in the UK. You lived in the UK for quite a number of years, uh, writing in English, as you just said, um, and addressing an English language audience. Um, and now you're back in Japan, um, coming mm -hmm. to us from Kobe, a lovely city. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the differences when you're addressing maybe an English language audience or a Western audience versus when you're writing in Japanese and illustrating for a Japanese audience. Are there differences in how you approach your art? Uh, and are there differences in how it's received in the two cultures and the two languages? Well, I've, um, I've been published by 
English publishers, and I have a very little experience of uh, doing a book in Japanese with Japanese editors. So I'm not really sure. And lots of my books are translated into Japanese by myself. And um, so I don't know really about the difference, but being published in UK and also children's books are often uh, translated into different languages. And I kind of, I'm used to uh, being led by many different kind of people from different countries. So I try to make it clear uh, logically. And uh, also picture books are a combination of stories and visuals. So it helps to understand, to make it clearer uh, what I'm trying to say. Um, so difference between Japan and UK, for example, I'm not quite sure. Certain things become very popular in Japan, but not so in other countries or the vice versa. For example, some very popular books in UK, not necessarily successful here. So there's a taste differences, but I um, can't really say. Um, but I, I think more books are translated from Japan to other countries. And um, that's maybe the same with literature. Um, but I don't know. I'm not really have a good, good answer for that. Do you feel like um, there are more um, restrictions? Uh, for example, if you're targeting uh, children, I know in mm. some cases you're writing work that targets a uh, an audience that's younger or a children's story, not in all cases, yeah. but in some cases. Yeah. Are there differences in what you can say and what you can draw when you're addressing a, a younger audience? E yes, um, I think, um, um, yeah, I think linguistically, yeah, uh, is you can't use certain words, but I can say uh, it's language you not know, that um, a barrier for me. Um, you can say the same thing. It's it's a simpler languages, and also it's it's visual art. Yeah, so so it's not that uh, a problem. But there's some problem in America. In I guess in America is slightly different from. UK or other countries about what the the publisher think about children, what they understand or or yeah, bit bit sort of sensitive in America. For example, it's like a nakedness. When a baby is naked, that's all right in other countries, but in America it's <laughs> become a little problem. Something mm -hmm. like that, and uh, but otherwise, I can't really think of much difference between countries. Mm -hmm. But I suppose mm -hmm. in Japan, this is uh, Japan has been a kind of country with just a single language, uh, and for many centuries, and uh, the country is not inv in invaded. Or oh, although it's a mixture, we we have lots of Korean Chinese or other people. So it's not a sing single cultural country, but the lang lang linguistically, um, we have quite sort of sort of one language nation in a way, which right. is uh, different from other countries. And I have experienced the sort of mix mixing with other cultures in UK. And uh, so there must be some differences, but this is a kind of very complex mm. uh, thing, which takes mm. a long time to yeah. discuss, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think we can extend the uh, question to literature in, in general. For instance, the way uh, short stories, the way short stories are written in, in Japan and in English speaking mm. countries, you know, in. Short stories written in English-speaking countries are generally 
uh, longer than than the ones written in in Japan, and uh, that's partly because uh, writers are required to, or, or well, people assume that the uh, people hope uh, writers to uh, describe the uh, situations or settings more uh, specifically and concretely in uh, in the English language than 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 in Japan, and uh, uh, when uh, the writer moves from a uh, uh, reality to fantasy, um, you know, in Japan you can you know just say, you can just say it you know you don't really have to set it up, but uh, English speaking countries you need to be more elaborate when you move on from reality to fantasy that sort of thing. Do Do you think that like Haiku poem or waka mm. short short poems in Japan in the possibility it, it's possible because of we shared kind of uh whatever like the season the, the perception of a season so we can immediately understand without any explanation because of we share this sort of right right but you can yeah you can leave things out because you share mm. so much mm. Mm. but you can't do this in other countries you have to explain you have to because we we have we share that that sense of season so you can say something and then immediately you know this is about autumn or spring or whatever mm -hmm. that's not quite possible in probably in other culture mm, i don't know mm, mm. but because of the global warning those seasonal words <laughs> don't work anymore <laughs> <laughs> probably, so, yes. hike poets are having a quite a dip, great great difficulty you know mm. writing about you know the coolness of summer which doesn't exist any longer that sort mm. of thing mm. mm -hmm. roland yeah i'd like to um uh, mentioned here that the, I think one of the topics that we address in in Monkey and have addressed uh, throughout the years is the relatively porous interaction between what we consider reality uh, or mm. or realistic fiction versus what we consider uh, at least in English surrealistic or dreamlike scenarios. Mm. And I think you know to go back to the genesis of Monkey, uh, the project uh, and the title. Uh, is to show uh, how how playful uh, Japanese literature can be. And of course, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, uh, manga, which is a top-selling graphic story format in North America now, manga tops the charts all the time. And one of the things that um, uh, manga readers tell me they really love is the playfulness, the freedom, mm -hmm. the kind of libertarian mm -hmm. freedom that manga storytellers have. And you certainly also see that in uh, Japanese fiction and literature and uh, visual art. So um, I also want to add here, encourage you to ask questions uh, in the chat, and we'll try to address them here before we have to wind up. Uh, so you can simply uh, jot questions into the chat, and we'll try to address them. But Moto, do you want to try this uh, bilingual reading idea? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. This is a... a this would be a good example of the uh, sense of playness, uh, playfulness we've been talking about. There's a book. Oh, I have it. This is from a story called A Piano Transformer. What's the English title? Transformer Piano? Transformer Piano. Okay, by a writer named uh, Kaori Fujino. Fujino Kaori. Uh, I would describe her as a, as pop and gothic, or maybe I should say goth these days. And uh, uh, in in this story, the p pianos come alive and and go quite wild, but uh, humans are wild too. And this uh, passage shows how wild humans can be. Ready, Roland? I'm ready. Mm, okay. 私と妹はピアノの蓋に座った We'd sit on top of the keyboard lid. 裸足で立って飛び降りることもあった Sometimes we stood barefoot up there and jumped off. ピアノの転板にも座った 
We even sat on the very top. そこからも飛び降りた。Jumped off from that too. 手を洗わずに鍵盤に触れ、マーガリンやジャムやチョコレートやアイスクリームや泥をなすりつけた。We touched the keys without washing our hands first, smearing margarine, jam, chocolate, ice cream, and mud across everything. 鍵盤に突っ伏してよだれを垂らした。We napped face down on the ivories, drooling on the keys. Licked them too. 指先以外のもので鍵盤をついて、リコーダーとか鉛筆とか定規とかリカちゃん人形の指と指がくっついた手で。We beat them with things other than our fingers, recorders, pencils, rulers, our doll Rika's hands, even though her fingers were fused together. あるいは鍵盤を下に押すんじゃなくて、反対に鍵盤の縁に爪を引っ掛けて上に外そうとした。Instead of pushing down on the keys with our fingers, we used our nails to raise them, trying to pry them loose. We didn't ease the lid down, we slammed it. Sometimes we lowered it part way and let gravity do the rest. どちらの場合もピアノの内部でいくつもの弦が震えくぐもった悲鳴が聞こえた。Either method always set the strings trembling and we could hear their muffled cries inside the piano. ピアノの椅子に座り足の裏を蓋に押し付けて椅子の片側の足を浮かした。We sat on the bench and put our, put our feet to the lid, pushing until the bench teetered on only two legs. そうやってぐらぐら揺れるピアノの椅子で漫画を読んだ。We balanced there, rocking, reading manga. ペダルの使い方はまだ習っていなかったのに、むやみやたらと踏みまくって、弾いていない時でも踏んだ。We hadn't learned how to use the pedals yet, but we stomped on them. 私が弾いている時には、妹がピアノの下に潜り、手やお尻で押したりもした。Sometimes while I was playing, my sister would dive under the keys and push the pedals with her hands or her rear. お母さんは私たちを怒鳴り、叱り、ピアノさんがかわいそうでしょ、などと言ったが、お母さんだって加害者だ。My mother would scold and yell and say things like, Don't you feel sorry for Mr. Piano? But she was another bad guy. 私たちをピアノから遠ざけなかった。She never separated us from the piano. 同罪。She was equally guilty. こういったピアノに対する虐待はおそらく多くの家庭で行われていたことと思う。I imagine this kind of piano abuse happens in a lot of households. ピアノたちが我々への報酬を誓い、放棄したとしても不自然ではないと私たちは考えている。And me and my sister think it's not at all unnatural that the piano is vowed to retaliate with an uprising. ピアノが人に噛みつくようになって割り送ったのは、例えば私の先生だ。Once the pianos learned to bite, the ones who got the short end of the stick were people like, for example, my piano teacher. 音楽を本当に愛する人。The people who really love music. Okay, that's it.、うん I think you can、uh, probably hear from that short reading that、uh, a part of the story is about the pianos anthropomorphized、uh, fighting back against these two、uh, young girls who are、uh, abusing the piano, engaging in piano abuse, which is,、uh, of course, a scourge on all of us.、Um, mm-hmm. And it's a wonderful story. And I hope you can hear from that short reading、uh, that Moto did in Japanese and I did in English that. These stories、um, slip into what we would think of as the surreal、uh, mm. or the magical or the otherworldly with great ease. And you could probably see that also in Satoshi's wonderful work, both for the current magazine and the older story, The Man on the Piano. There is a, a very porous membrane in Japanese storytelling between what we consider. Uh, our lived in reality and our dream world or the dream world、mm. of our lives. And all that is captured in this wonderful、uh, illustration by an、uh, American artist named Sam Messer. So, so, our magazine is not, you know, not 
all is from Japan. We sort of encourage uh, uh, dialogues between uh, uh, Japan and other countries. And uh, uh, this is this is one example. I, okay. So shall we take questions? Sure. Um, one thing I would just uh, add that mm. uh, broadly speaking, um, I often say that um, Japan is a, a, a land of, of limited natural resources, mm. uh, as many of you know, uh, but also a land of seemingly limitless imagination. Mm. It's uh, the resources of Japan are embedded in stories um, and not just contemporary stories, but uh, centuries mm. of storytelling. Mm. In fact, uh, it, Japan is credited with creating the very first novel, what we think of as uh, the novel, uh, the tale mm. of Genji, mm. Genji Monogatari. Mm. It's a storytelling nation, really. And I think people don't often realize that when thinking about Japanese art craftsmanship, of course, um, uh, beautiful visual art, uh, which Monkey contains, but also just great stories. It's, it's a land mm, of stories. Mm, mm, mm. And uh, in this talk, we sort of emphasize the, the, the brevity and, uh, and the taking things out, uh, which is uh, prevalent in, in Japanese literature. But uh, uh, good storytellers also very good at uh, uh, repeating things, you know, they, they have a uh, nice use of of a repetition, and uh, which is something uh, some editors in English speaking countries do not understand. And uh, when they edit uh, Japanese uh, writings, they try to take out you know uh, uh, what they feel to be redundant. And uh, uh, you know, monkey is we are enormously fortunate having uh, Meg Taylor who understands the uh, the artistic logic of, of Japanese culture and also you know uh, uh, the uh, uh, artistic and uh, necessity in in uh, you know English speaking countries so sh she knows you know both elements very very well and uh, and uh, uh, you know I stopped uh, talking about uh, editing process. Uh, with uh, with uh, my editing, uh, uh, my my the the, the point where I check uh, the the translators uh, mm -hmm. uh, a product, but then I you know uh, go get uh, give it to to Meg Taylor and Ted Goosen, and they uh, work on the the English aspect of the of the prose. Yeah, I should quickly mention uh, I two translators I think I didn't mention earlier. Um, mm. Takaoka's Travels uh, mm. is uh, mm. translated by David Boyd, mm. who's a frequent uh, contributor, wonderful translator in uh, Monkey. And um, the uh, the Shibasaki novel is translated, uh, I believe, by Jeffrey Angles, uh, if that's right. Uh, Shibasaki, uh, Shibasaki novel? I uh, think oh, that... Oh, am I wrong? That's Polly Barton. Oh, sorry, that's Polly Barton. Yes, yeah. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Angles, Angles did, did the uh, the Ito novel, Hiromi Ito novel. Hiromi Ito novel. So all of those names of the translators you will find featured mm. in mm. several issues of Monkey. Mm. They're all mm. uh, really mm. extraordinary. So here's a, a quick question, uh, Moto. I think and Satoshi you may want to chime in on a translation and storytelling going from uh, Japanese to English, which is. Um, uh, the question of the the sort of classical three act structure uh, of Western storytelling, which of course you tend to see most dramatically in Hollywood uh, film scripts, but the sort of three act story that we often expect even from novels written in English or coming from the West, and when uh, you're translating a novel or telling a story in Japanese. Um, do you try to fit it into that three act structure when you go into English? Because as we know, a lot of uh, Japanese novels and Japanese stories don't contain that that specific uh, that uh, specific format. Uh, in fact, um, one of the reactions to Haruki Murakami when he was first translated into English is that the stories didn't seem to have endings or they didn't have the sort of climax that you would expect at the end of the second act, for example. Uh, maybe Moto, you want to address that first. Do, do you think of trying to fit it into 
that kind mm, of narrative mm, structure, mm, or do you just mm, let it mm, go? Mm, and, and... Mm, mm, mm. You know, in, in Japan, there's a saying, uh, like, see trees and not the woods. So you, you know, you look at only small things and the uh, not the whole context, and that's not good. And that, that's, that's the point of the saying. But uh, with translation, uh, you you have only to you know look at you know trees, not the woods. You know? Mm. Um, you know it's it's a bottom up thing. You know you you work on small things and uh, you know bigger picture. You know sort of um, builds it come builds itself. You know, of um, and uh, and uh, the the uh, the structure you mentioned is is the uh, you know something with the uh, with the woods. So. That's not the uh, uh, the translator's uh, sphere, you know. Um, we we uh, um, the, the, the translators and can cannot work on you know that aspect of the of the story, I think. Mm. Um, Satoshi. Mm. Oh yes. Um, because I work on picture books. Um, they are sort of visual and language together and it's kind of organically they tell a story so the typical process of my making book is a highlight and draw at the same time and uh, the book progress as, as book progresses the lighting become less and less because the picture tells the story more and more so when the story gets so short, so short that it can't make sense if I take anything out of it, mm. then that means the picture is telling a lot of stories. So that's the kind of, you know, when the story is done, when the book is done, that's when, you know, the all, I mean, more and more story is told by the pictures. And the less uh, the text is become less and less. So this is probably very different from what literature does. You know, you you have to tell the story linguistically or with words, but mine's more like a story. And if the picture and the uh, pictures and um, text uh, together makes sense. To me and to the leaders, then that's 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 the kind of the book is done. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I fail. So sometimes I show it to someone or editor, and somehow it's not quite makes sense. Or you know, so that's how I work. So I don't know. You're you're talking about language or or more about the text, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of talking about both pictures and text together yeah in that way in that way pictures can sometimes transcend text the same way music can can yeah, sometimes also, uh, motto mm -hmm. is sometimes say about the uh, pictures translation illustration as translation so when we did the book together he translates mm -hmm. the poem english poem and i sort of did the illustration and it's somehow he he uh, model thought the illustration there also another kind of translation, which in a way yeah makes sense to me. Yes, it's mm. about how to interpret uh, the same text visually and by linguistically. Yeah, and we, it's an important process for, for me to to do a book, book with pictures. Because I have to sort of understand or interpret whatever mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, the visual and also in language. Yeah. Right. And his picture translations are sometimes funniest when they are not really faithful. You know, sometimes he distorts the stories with his pictures, and that's that's when the, the fun comes in. Yeah, I, both... I work with a couple of, I mean, some. English poets, and uh, they seem to like the way I interpret their poems because I'm not sort of, I'm not just uh, this sort of showing that the 
the scenes of whatever the poem is saying. I'm sort of sometimes I kind of draw an afterthoughts of a poem or something like that. Yes. Mm. You both talked about the shared cultural understanding in Japan that you can because of the the centuries of the language and uh you know relatively archipelago bound population for centuries that you can you can quickly refer to something and mm -hmm. in the japanese language and many people will understand it without having to have it explained um these days there are plenty of tourists coming into japan but there's less non-japanese literature being translated into japanese and certainly in popular music, um, when I first moved here, there were a lot of uh, uh, non-Japanese pop stars who would come to Japan and tour, and that has decreased dramatically since I've been here. Japanese audiences seem to be more focused on Japanese music and maybe Japanese literature and less so on foreign influences outside mm -hmm. uh, the country. I'm wondering if, you know, that same shared cultural understanding that Japanese have in their own language and in their own cultural touchstones, is that a challenge for Japanese audiences when non-Japanese stories come into the country or non-Japanese poems come into Japan? That that shared cultural understanding makes it more difficult or does it make it more difficult to understand foreign or non-Japanese mm -hmm. storytelling and poetry? Mm -hmm. You know, on one hand, we share so much in, in uh, you know, so-called one culture, but uh, also, you know, we've been uh, culturally, you know, importing so much, you know, uh, before from, from mainly from China and since from the uh, uh, mid 19th century from, uh, you know, uh, countries in the West. So, uh, you know, uh, there, there's, there have been lots of, um, mm, you know, uh, cultural uh, import imports, uh, you know, as far as you know, Japanese culture is concerned, and uh, um, the fact you mentioned that uh, there is less coming in from abroad um, is, in one sense, uh, it could be a sign of arrogance or ignorance, you know, self complacency, but uh, I like to think that there is also uh, uh, the fact that the uh, uh, the exchanges are getting sort of uh, you know more of a two way things rather than you know you know importing everything and not exporting anything you know there's uh, so much culture going on between you know uh, between Japan and the West you know as as uh, you know you, your your book Japan America you know um, and, and emphasize that point you know. Mm -hmm. Satoshi, do you read a lot of uh, 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 graphic artists from outside of Japan these days? Well, not so many, but I I like um, one. I think she's from Israel, uh, called Lutu Mudan. She's mm -hmm. a really good graphic artist. Um, well, I don't read enough. Uh, maybe because I don't have enough time or I don't have enough information. But there are, yes, lots of good authors from different cultures. Um, the, but because of, you know, um, we have this YouTube, so we kind of have all sorts of different culture, especially music-wise, we are exposed to different cultures, which is Mm -hmm. a good thing yeah but um in a way sometimes uh when it comes to children's books um it's there's a sort of time that japan imported a lot in maybe 40 years ago 50 years ago or more more 60 years ago i guess but then then we have lots of good authors artists so we probably import less and this happens in other countries as well, like for say 20 years ago, I was invited to Mexico and uh, I did a lecture to a young artist 
And at the time, there aren't so many Mexican authors, artists, but now there are plenty. And um, I hear nowadays China uh, is buying lots of books from abroad, mm -hmm. including in Japan and UK and elsewhere. And maybe in 10 years time, they don't sort of import that much because they have hopefully many good artists, authors. So this happens in children's books. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, China is producing a lot of anime, by the way, right now, and is uh, is uh, ready to compete with Japan uh, in the anime business. So um, that may well happen in the future as well. Moto, just one last quick question. We don't have that much time, I know. But um, uh, somebody asked, you know, how do you go about choosing the right translator for a specific work? How do you make that choice? And I know we've talked about this in the past, but maybe you could address that quick question. How do you choose the translator for the work or does it happen a different way? Well, sometimes the translators, you know, wor uh, choose works, you know, they, they recommend good uh, stories to us and uh, that happens too. And I don't know, I mean, you know, all the uh, best translators we have are, are you know, friends of, good friends of us. So we know, you know, each other very well. So um, it's, it's, it's quite easy, you know, uh, we, we sort of know, you know, a certain tr uh, story would be good for this one and not for that one and that sort of thing. Um, um, yeah, you simply, you know, have to be, you know, uh, friends with, uh, with translators. And I think translator, a lot of translators themselves have told me that uh, the key the key deciding factor for them is that they really love mm, the original mm, work, mm, that they mm, feel mm, very mm, personally passionate mm, about mm. the work itself. And uh, when we don't know what to do, you know, we ask you, Roland. You know, that's <laughs> what you know. That's why you are uh, called contributing. Uh, this uh no, contributing editor yeah. that's my job yeah that's my job just quickly these are the two most recent publications from monkey uh the links that uh, joanne provided earlier are on the site this is monkey volume four which is out in uh, north america and around the world in several versions print all the ebook versions are available through the website um, and I think through Amazon as well and some terrific bookshops, including a uh, Porter Square bookstore in Cambridge, where I, I used to live uh, very close to Porter Square bookstore. And this book, Dragon Palace by Hiromi Kawakami, uh, translated by Ted Goosen, which has been named to uh, 100 Best Books of 223 by The New Yorker and uh, is a terrific, terrific book. Uh, and the cover of this one is by Satoshi Kitamura, who is with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Moto, and thank you, Satoshi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.